And today we have a, a title called When Innovation and Research Meets the Challenges of Digital Transformation. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to again say thank you to all our participants for uh, constantly being with us and uh, listening in and, and uh, collaborating and, send, and sharing your own experiences uh, on instructional design in the digital age. It is my pleasure today uh, to welcome our most esteemed speaker, Dr. Mark Camacho, uh, and I would like to read her bio data on this. Yeah. Okay, here goes uh, Dr. Mar's uh, biodata. So Dr. Mar um, is a lecturer in educational technology. Um, I met Dr. Mar a few years ago. We were on the ICT in education agenda in Budapest, Hungary. And that was when we connected and we felt that we had uh, areas of research and, uh, and interests that were related to uh, digital learning and training. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mar went on to become a former, she was a former director general of innovation research and digital culture at the Catalan government's department of education 2018 to 2021, just after I met her. Uh, Co-author of the first monography on mobile learning in Spain, Portugal and Latin America. She was also Director General of Primary and Childhood Education at the Catalan Ministry of Education in July 2018, and also Director General of Innovation Research and Digital Culture in December 2018. Uh, Dr. Mar has done extensive work um, globally, okay, especially with the UNESCO and the ITU, the uh, International Telecommunications Union, uh, and uh, she keeps on progressing and publishing and researching in the area of innovation and research. Uh, and, and also today, this is what she's going to be talking to us about when innovation and research meets the challenges of digital transformation. Let's all welcome Dr. Mark Marcho. Hi, Dr. Mark, welcome on board. And again, uh, our huge thanks to you for taking your time out and, 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 and sharing with us today and being with us today. Uh, I have seen your work and I'm very impressed about what you have done and is doing. So uh, we would like you to say a little bit more about you, maybe share a little bit something that I could not share on the uh, previously earlier. Something you'd like to say uh, about maybe your passion in this area or your previous work done. Yes, uh, good morning, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, thank you so much for this kind invitation. I have been following the webinar series that you're offering and they are really interesting. And I'm sure that they can be a lot of, of, of help to, to so many professionals in the higher education uh, field. Uh, as you were saying, you most uh, mostly uh, some up my the, the most important key points of my uh, CV. However, I just wanted to to add something. I was named director general for uh, the, the the title of my director general was always innovation, research, and digital culture. There was a normative uh, gap that we had to cover, but I've never been director of uh, childhood or primary education because I'm not an expert on the field. However, I had to be named on the, under that uh, title. Meanwhile, the different changes were taking place until we, we got the, the real one. So my oh. field of expertise, as you were saying before, Dr. Abdar, has always been educational technology. I consider myself uh, quite a pioneer because, for example, in the field of mobile learning, I started working with them even before UNESCO launched their the, the first um, um, mobile learning normative and documents. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was already working on that, and I consider myself someone who has always been working with technology. Uh, taking into account all the transformation that this technology has has uh, uh, was bringing uh, with, no. So um, that has uh, made me and many of other professionals, I'm sure, uh, keep always uh, updated 
we have always to be very aware of the of the challenges and risks that these technologies are uh, taking with it and how um, this potential, and, and especially regarding the educational field, can be uh, transforming and also can change the life of so many students as we, I think that this is the ultimate objective that we, that we um, want to achieve, no? Thank you, Dr. Mar. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, we shall start our session today. I think Dr. Mar has uh, prepared some uh, slides herself so that you could uh, maybe uh, share those with us. Okay, can you see them, Dr. Abdar? Can you um, see the slides? I think they are coming. Yes, they are. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, as I was saying before, before I start, I'd like to thank the organization of the Asia Pacific University and the Digital Learning Hub for having invited me to participate in these webinars, which topic is uh, when innovation and research meet the challenges of digital information uh, transformation. Although this topic is in itself of great importance, it's more than evident that it acquires a magnificent meaning in the post-COVID times. I have been working in the field of educational technology for many years now, and the discourse is not new. We need to prepare our students to become digitally competent in order to face all the challenges that living and working in the digital age convey. Evidently, new roles and competencies for teachers and um, students uh, need to be rethought if we want our educational systems to progress and to advance. Therefore, it is also essential that educational institutions focus on them as the key stakeholders that they are when it comes to address and promote change. At a time when artificial intelligence and big data and other emerging technologies are acquiring more and more relevance um, and shaping all the fields of society, it is extremely important as well that educational authorities foresee their potential and include them as many institutions as UNESCO, for example, are already be doing in their agendas. As you can see, the title of this keynote speech is Digital Competence. It's when innovation and research meet the challenges of digital uh, transformation. During this, um, this uh, exposition, this presentation, I will analyze different key aspects regarding these challenges of digital transformation in higher educational institutions. And um, I'm always uh, I'm going to focus as well in which ways research can support the implementation of policy recommendation and what is more important to see how this research is connected to the needs of institutions and their leaders and teachers and students. During this uh, keynote, I will address five key issues and I will conclude with um, five ideas to, to sum them up. The rapid development and spread of digital technologies are contributing to change in every aspect of people's lives, businesses and society, as OECD says. Some authors consider digital transformation as a more pervasive set of changes that digital technologies cause or affecting all aspects of human life. The digital transformation is intrinsically connected to what has been defined as the fourth industrial revolution, a process through which digital technologies are shaping the future of society and economic development. Digital transformation is a process of involving, involving uh, several digital technologies from 5G to artificial intelligence, big data or blockchain. These technologies form an ecosystem through which future economic and social changes will arise. And it is uh, very important for higher education institutions that are dealing with digital transformation to include them. <clears throat> A part of that, deal, dealing with this uh, digital transformation also means introducing new digital processes in their organizations, adopting new digital teaching methods and tools helping students in achieving the skills and competencies needed to act in digitalized societies and economies. It also means adopting a broader view of the role of actors as actors of digital innovation. <clears throat> the first, uh, the first um, 
key issue that I wanted to uh, address is the, the context that the post-COVID educational crisis has left <clears throat> behind. The state of education around the world in the era post-COVID is evidenced by the tremendous inequalities that the pandemic times have left behind. It is important to focus on equity, to investigate how progress through education and the associated learning and labor market outcomes are impacted by dimensions such as gender, socioeconomic status, or country or birth and regional location. As OECD's recent report, Education at a Glance 2021 states, it is in this context when the digital gap acquires special relevance. The second one is digitally the need of digitally competent teacher, leaders for digitally competent institutions. While I was um, director general um, during the COVID eruption back in March 2020 from the Ministry of Education, from the Catalan Department of Education, we had to install 800 LMSs in 800 schools which didn't have any evidence of uh, digital work in their, um, in their daily practices. Um, this is a huge number of students. This is an example. Eh? This is an example. Um, that was a huge number of students and teachers who hadn't had any contact until, um, until then, when digital technologies really uh, were needed, no? because all of us were at home and we had to work. Uh, from the distance and um, we have a lot of evidence that not the, the totality of the schools in Catalonia, as it has happened in many universities um, around the world, um, didn't have the, the, all the conditions needed to face the challenges that the pandemic brought with. Um, Apart from that, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't teaching at university then, but it, it happened the same. We, we, there were a lot of situations in which um, many teachers were prepared, but others weren't. And, and they had to face uh, a lot of challenges and in, a, in, in, in a very, very, very limited span of time. So it is a fact that the new profiles of teachers, of, of higher institution uh, lecturers, leaders need to include the digital competence. Leaders are the key to success. So if we want to face all the challenges that living in the digital age requires, we need to face that challenge as well. Achieving a good digital competence that especially contemplates a strong methodological approach is essential when we need to connect as well digital competencies with the achievement of digital of educational objectives. We need to keep in mind that the digital technologies always need to serve educational and academic um, objectives to make uh, our students, of course, progress and advance. As you can see in this slide, this is uh, some, inf some information which has been extracted from the Digital Education Action Plan uh, launched by the European Union, <clears throat> the 90% of future jobs are going to require digital skills. 44% of Europeans like, lack basic digital skills. Less than 20% of ICT professionals are female. And more than 48,000 schools lack broadband connection. Finally, digital well-being is threatened by misinformation, cyberbullying, and data privacy issues. Taking into account all these, um, all these facts, which are um, extremely uh, worrying, the European uh, Union launched three really big uh, frameworks regarding the acquisition of digital competence. The first one, um, the DIGCOM, which is the Digital Competence Framework for Teachers. The, the second one would be the DIGCOM EDU, which is the digital competence addressed uh, to students. And we have here all the, the different dimensions of digital competence uh, structure and, and organized. And then we have the DIGCOM org framework, which is the framework addressed to digital to the institutions. And, and, and it <clears throat> 
it aims to achieve this, uh, what, what they call the digital competent um, organizations. No? So they are organizations that unite the acquisition of this digital competence by their uh, students, teachers, and they are able to face all the challenges of the digital transformation as they as they approach no? infrastructure, connectivity, pedagogical issues, uh, digital well-being, the risks of living with uh, and having our technology around, the use of uh, mobile uh, phones, for example, etc. <clears throat> so the, the third idea would be that we can't do evidence-based policy without evidence. It is, it is extremely important. There is a lot of recent literature and international reports that advocate for the need to implement, as you can see here, <clears throat> to implement evidence-based research to inform educational practices. The need to gather evidence then is key, as it is shown by scientific literature. Um, this fact, however, um, highlights as well that there is a very important existing gap between research and the real needs of uh, educational institutions. As I was saying, there is a lot of, uh, of, of literature. Uh, there have been um, frameworks which have been created uh, to, to foster evidence-based policy making. Uh, as you can see, there are uh, publications from the European Union, uh, support mechanisms for evidence-based policy making in education, evidence-based policy making, the politics of evidence-based policy making, and then a uh, really big question of how to change evidence-based policy, policy making and policy makers, of course, and the answer would be, of course, no, because uh, COVID has changed everything and has subverted and has uh, has uh, um, made a lot of inequalities uh, emerge. Uh, there are other publications. Uh, these two are in Spanish, but they are issued by issued by UNESCO, so you can find them also in English and, and many other languages. Uh, no dejar nadie atrás en tiempos de COVID, so no one. Uh, can be left behind during COVID uh, times, and then uh, some reports which uh, account for the way in which education uh, during pandemic times um, has been. No? And then this report by OECD, recent report, a recent report which is a name, a building capacity for evidence informed policy making. Apart from that, apart from that, there is a huge need to um, to take into con consideration uh, the, the growing focus of measuring learning. Uh, in this report by the um, New Media Consortium back in 2017, um, it was considered a driving at tech adoption in, in higher education for the next three to five years. So we're in 2021. So uh, we could say we could say that this um, focus and then this need to focus on measuring learning has been achieved and has been incorporated into um, into policy making uh, decisions, uh, which have uh, which, which, which are really important. If we don't incorporate evidence-based uh, policies into in the, in, the, in the policies that we're going to be launching, um, it's difficult that we meet the real needs of uh, our educational systems. The, the fourth and last idea would be which role do these uh, emerging technologies um, play? Uh, the analysis, the analysis of big uh, of big data, for example, another advanced system such as artificial intelligence or blockchain and, and others become extremely important to favor decision making informed by evidence and precipitate innovative and systemic changes. The, impl the implementation of artificial intelligence then and other technologies can improve the efficiency and personalization of learning tasks. 
Artificial intelligence has the potential to help students develop their skills and acquire more knowledge in multiple subjects. But a part of that, they can provide uh, personalized information to meet students' academic needs. There is a lot, there are a lot of examples now worldwide in which educational systems um, are integrating this uh, technology, for example, to foresee, to predict, to, to see uh, how uh, their educational achievements are, are advancing, if they are. Um, and in, in this context, then artificial intelligent learning environments can adapt to the student's level of skill, to their mastery of coursework, etc. Does it identify the challenges that they face? Accordingly, it provides relevant materials and activities to boost students' knowledge based upon um, specific subjects and learning needs. Apart from that, they provide a tailored, um, tailored made learning environments, which, which is quite um, quite important to, um, especially to face all the challenges that uh, special educational uh, special education students um, need to face, and of course to. Um, to meet the needs of all and every one of uh, our students. And to conclude, to conclude this brief presentation, because um, we were told that we that there was going to be some some discussion on the different topics that I pointed out, and I didn't want really to, to spend a whole hour. Uh, speaking myself because I think dialogue and, and exchange is, is always more important and more uh, enriching. Um, I would like to, to signal that it's very important that higher educational institutions uh, work closely with uh, to provide evidence and propose policies and to build the research in areas of importance of um, those who are driving the national agenda. When it comes to terms of fostering innovation and the transformation of uh, institutions, the possibility of having governments and institutions, as it, it is the case, for example, in the United Kingdom, of the Educational Endowment Foundation that supports the schools across the country by using evidence so that, so that it can um, have the maximum possible benefit for children and young people, um, our um, experiences like, like that are um, really strong and powerful. To conclude, to conclude, I, uh, these are the, 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 the five, um, maybe the five uh, most important ideas that I wanted to, to signal uh, during this, um, uh, this presentation. The first one would be that the post-COVID era has highlighted the urgent need for the digitalization of education and the acquisition of digital skills by teachers, students, families. Uh, the role of higher education institutions is a key piece in this process. The second one would be that it's very important, extremely important to bring research closer to the teaching an organizational practice of higher education institutions and always um, decisions have to be placed in favor of the opportunities of students and their needs so that no one is left behind. There is another important need to generate education policies, educational policies increasingly informed by evidence and to foster a type of research that is sensitive to the knowledge and transformation needs of higher education institutions and as a whole of the education system. It is important as well, although we have to be aware of the risks that they convey, to incorporate the analysis of big data and other advanced systems such as artificial intelligence to favor decision making informed by evidence and, precipitate, and to precipitate innovative and systemic changes. And finally, it is also extremely important to monitor and evaluate the impact of research from the beginning and to share the achievements and progress with the entire educational community, which is something that we uh, researchers sometimes uh, forget. So that is um, more or less the, the, the approach that I wanted to share 
with you um, and really I'm very open to answer and to start the dialogue um, as you as you wish and, and to answer all your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mar, for this uh, excellent presentation and uh, sharing of your experiences. Uh, I know research is really at the heart of, uh, of uh, what we academicians do. And um, without the research, it is very difficult for us to, 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 to uh, impress uh, especially uh, on policies. I think it is always important that our research is done uh, intensively and comprehensively enough so that uh, maybe we could uh, then, uh, uh, you know, make a proper, uh, have the proper judgments, proper perceptions, and then uh, come up with the proper policies. Uh, let's see, we have uh, Mr. Paul Sim who said, uh, hi, doctor, if I may ask, in regards to Industry 4.0, um, do you think that this has played a part in raising awareness of uh, digitization? Cost, from my understanding, is like a form of marketing. So uh, Paul Sim is uh, trying to ask your perspective, okay, on uh, whether, whether it is a hype that has been created by industry uh, in terms of the use of uh, industry f uh, of use of 4.0, IR 4.0, or is that a real impact in the teaching and learning process? I think, I think even if I may uh, word uh, Paul Sims, uh, or, or if I may echo him, I would probably ask the same question. <laughs> so is there a real impact in, in terms of the whole teaching and learning process? Or is it a hype in terms of use of the emerging technologies? I mean, what does the research say? I mean, we, 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 you know, we need to see uh, the research aspects of things. Um, yes. Mark, over to yes. you. Okay, I think that uh, we are going to see the impact in the following in the following years. Not really now, but what we are seeing and research is evidencing is that all these uh, technologies are definitely uh, changing and shaping the way in which educational practices um, are, are are taking place. I mean. Um, Apart from the of this um, marketing and, and, and this uh, the, 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 the very powerful industry uh, that is behind no? the implementation of these technologies, there is also there are a lot of ethical issues here that could be discussed uh, regarding the ways in which this uh, technology is uh, um, can have access to to a lot of uh, data, personal data of our students, for example of the different actions that we take uh, into uh, that we carry, carry out uh, during our our classes etc i think that we are at the very hands of, of these uh, technological um, hubs but our duty as researchers is uh, is basically this uh, we have this research we have we have this evidence and we have to be aware and to, and to share all these concerns to the, to the policymakers, uh, to the people who, who have the responsibilities, uh, because uh, all these uh, huge uh, emerging technologies that are going, and definitely, because this is, a, this is certain, they are going to shape the education in, in the future years. Um, we have to be aware of all the risks and all the, con the ethical concerns, for example, that they may convey, and we have to rely on research and carry out a lot, a lot of uh, significant, significant uh, investigations and researches and international collaboration projects to see and to, and to uh, explore the potentials that they have uh, to help uh, educational systems advance because they also 
they also have them. But regarding the impact, I think that we're going, we, we, we are not able now to, to, to foresee the, their impact. But uh, UNESCO, for example, has a, a huge streamline focused on uh, the impact of uh, artificial uh, intelligence on education. So if the, this higher, uh, the, the, the most important educational institutions in the world are um, focusing on the impact of these uh, technologies, uh, we have to think that they're going to be present in our lives and in our professional lives as well for many years. And we have to learn, we have to um, research, do a lot of research, and we uh, we need to, to be a, a strong task force to fight all these commercial and, 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 and interests of the industry that may be, uh, that may not coincide with, with ours, no? Thank you, Mar. Um, uh, Paul, I hope uh, this has been helpful to you and thank you for your question uh, uh, on, on this aspect. Um, we also have uh, Mr. Adrian Tan. Uh, he says that, may I know your suggestions on how teachers are supposed to handle students who are pretending to be on class, but are actually playing online games while class is ongoing. <laughs> um, yeah, that is a, a common problem, but it is an important question. Yeah. Um, and, and, and maybe, maybe I may add a little bit to what Adrian is saying. How, how can we use these four IR technologies, especially artificial intelligence, uh, to support the teacher? Because, uh, you know, we have so many students in our class and, and, and obviously we, uh, we, we can never, even in the physical class, we, we could never do this. We could never um, uh, uh, track, but I think there are ways, Adrian, uh, I think using instructional design methodologies, uh, there are ways, uh, but we, for me personally, before, sorry, before I, 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 I hand it over to you, Dr. Mar, um, I, I am, I am big on analytics. I'm big on analytics, but I personally feel the analytic side of things uh, have not uh, it's not up to my expectations the the intelligence of the analytics has not met my expectation as an educator i personally if i'm teaching a class of 30 i would like the technology to tell me Hey, look, there is one student who is playing with the phone and it's not concentrating on you, <laughs> for example. <laughs> or, 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 or out of the 10 quizzes you gave, um, these students need your further attention. I, I want the system to talk back to me, not me going back to the system and analyzing it. And by the time I finish analyzing, my class is over. So I think this is a very interesting uh, question, Adrian, and uh, we would... Uh, we, it would be nice to see uh, what Dr. Mar, and I know Dr. Mar, you are also moving towards artificial intelligence. And if you could share, I mean, I, I have my own projects related to AI as well, but uh, as you say, you know, the, the, uh, we, we, we ourselves are just starting. So if you have read something or you have dabbled with something, we will appreciate. Thank you. Yes, we, we are already starting with this. Uh, during the pandemic times, um, I, I, I wasn't delivering classes, so I was, I was uh, on, the, on the director general, but that uh, provided me with a huge vision. In Catalonia, we have uh, 1,500,000 students in the, in the uh, educational system uh, prior to university. So, uh, and we have uh, one, 100,000 uh, teachers approximately. Uh, oh. I'm preferring, yes, so we had to cater with, we had to provide solutions for everyone, no? At the very moment in which uh, nobody knew what to do, uh, how to deal with uh, technology. And then on the one hand, we had a lot of uh, schools and teachers uh, which had shown 
an, import, uh, uh, an important degree of maturity regarding the use of technologies in their classrooms so that those schools and those teachers could uh, go on and could um, could give continuity to the teaching process with no with with without difficulties more or less but then we had a lot of other teachers who had never used uh, technology in their classes who um, didn't see the use of using the and this i think because i've um, surrounded with uh, a lot of colleagues that were at university and it happened the same so there mm -hmm. were people who showed a lot of, of of uh, readiness, no, and their their personal implication, no, to overcome so with solutions all, all the difficulties. But then we had uh, a lot of uh, teachers, maybe, the, and, and this relates also with uh, the, the transformation of education, no, the innovation and the use of uh, methodological practices and teaching and learning. Uh, approaches that are more uh, adapted to 21st century learners. So if we pretend to provide our classes, no, to deliver our classes in the same way that, that they were given, uh, not before the pandemic, but in 20 or 25 or 30 or 35 years ago, maybe we have a problem. We have to see that our students are different, that our students um, um, live and have uh, have been born always accompanied. They have grown up uh, always with technology, and we have to make this technology attractive to them because not of, uh, not all of them like technology. And uh, if uh, I am a teacher, I need to see, uh, of course, if, uh, if if these students are, are with me in class, uh, it's it, it's quite easy, no. But if they aren't, I have to come up with solutions uh, to make their this class these classes available. I think that uh, non, non, no, not all of us were, were prepared in the same way and those differences were emerged during, during that special time. No? Um, uh, regarding these methodologies, for example, I would uh, talk about uh, the flip classroom or the use of of devices to to create no to create the activities and to and to provide content on the side of students and of course this shift of the role of the teachers the teachers uh, have to be um, have to be acting more than more, more as guides rather than simply deliverers of of content this is uh, this is this is not new no. Uh, I think that the support that uh, this uh, in artificial intelligence or this big data are going to provide to us, um, it, it's early to tell, but I, I, I believe that, that, that there's a, a huge um, potentiality um, behind those technologies if we are able and if we think in a clever way on how to, on how to use them. Uh, to serve our needs, no, our needs, and our needs are going to um, have always a relation uh, with the academic progress of our students. So um, we need to know uh, how these technologies um, can help the teacher uh, address the different uh, learning needs of our students and to provide personalized solutions to one of them, which is something that we we are not able to do now but i'm sure that we're going to to see in the in the future thank you mar um, um are you all planning to start a research project anytime mar so that maybe some of our participants yes, um of course okay <clears throat> so maybe we could keep in touch uh you know further to maybe talk about these research projects and it, 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 it might serve good for our participants today to know about them. And if there is any opportunity for our uh, Malaysian, I think I can see most of the participants uh, that are asking the questions are Malaysian participants. And if there's an opportunity that they can work, uh, you know, we can work together. Uh, that would be really great, um, you know, uh, like a comparative research study we can do between Catalonia and Malaysia. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. It's like yeah, we have another one. Uh, this is from uh, Darwishwar. Darwishwar said, 
I would like to know how the interaction with AI will be like in the future. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, in India, there are primary schools which are starting to use robots for educational purposes. So how do you predict teaching with robots and AI would feel for the students and the industry in the future? Seems like this is an interesting topic, yeah? Use of yeah. AI, robotics, uh, and vis-a-vis -vis the teaching and learning process. Um, I, 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 I would like to comment as well, but Mar, you proceed, uh, proceed with it. I, I don't mind even providing some of my thoughts on this. Okay, okay. Uh, I could uh, thank you for the questions yeah, to, to all of you. Um, regarding this last question, I have a, an example of something we tried to to in, to pilot while I was a director general because um, we we there, there's a priority issue to be discussed. The, the educational systems. Um, we don't know if they are ready, and if they are the, the data, if they already have all the data necessary, and all this data. We don't know if the the data of students, of, of schools, of teachers. Uh, we don't know if this data is uh, um, organized properly in order to um, carry out further um, studies, including this, but uh, this really uh, powerful technology. On, on the one hand, and this is something that happens in a lot of countries that we want to research and pilot things uh, regarding the implementation of these uh, technologies. And we see that we don't have uh, the systems and the ministries, they, they are not ready regarding this um, curation of, of data on the one hand. And then I would like to, and this is something that, that, that I myself experienced uh, when I was director general, no, we wanted to uh, start um, analyzing specific things, and we found out that um, the data were was not organized properly, no. So we, there's this uh, previous work that uh, ed educational institutions uh, or ministries, no, in this case, need to do. Uh, the data have to be really, um, really well. Um, uh, well prepared in order to um, in order to advance uh, regarding the, the incorporation of these other uh, important technologies, and apart from that, uh, we 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 foresee the importance of, of introducing these uh, robotics and, and and trying to see different experience no? in which artificial intelligence uh, could help us, and we uh, established a collaboration with IBM. Uh, I don't know whether you've heard of uh, a robot a technology. Yeah? It's, a, it's a technology, um, and, and they have a, a robot called Watson. Uh, and we uh, in, we created a project which we piloted in, in five ten schools, not not more, because the technology was really huge and very expensive. So they let us their technology. They 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 lent their technology to schools. And uh, there was this experience in schools uh, which was aimed to avoid uh, bullying in the classroom. So students, the students in, in these schools had to take um, different tests uh, using this technology, which created sociograms and identified within the, within the classroom different roles of students. Students that could be um more weak students that uh, could be uh, maybe they they could uh, show attitudes of um of, of um, negative attitudes towards others no so the teacher with all this picture big picture that this technology created could um reorganize the classroom and could um and this is something that all the teachers said to us could uh, could see things that they had never thought uh, about before, no? Uh, because we had we have all these uh, mental structures, no? That we think that oh, students that we've mm -hmm. known for so many years that they are going mm -hmm. to be this way and they are this way, and and these technologies showed uh, these mm -hmm. uh, these different profiles of students, no? Once these uh, students that could be 
um, that that seem that could be um, suffering maybe of of um, of some some attitudes, no, some violent attitudes towards them. They were they were um, able to speak to a robot because it was proven that the students it, we're talking about children, eh? uh, when 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 children were facing the robot, they were more eager to share with the robot. Uh, their thoughts rather than uh, with the teacher. So it was a very interesting. Although we 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 conclude our our um, this uh, period of uh, director general, we couldn't further go further with this project, but it, it was very interesting, and it was uh, it's a, a, a clear example on how technology is. Uh, a very artificial intelligent technology put at the service of the needs of uh, schools, for example, to determine these um, these factors that may prevent bullying no? in the future uh, by identifying these students, for example. Um, uh, could uh, this is an example on, on how this technology could be could be used, no? Nice. I think I think we will just proceed because there are a couple of more questions uh, that have been okay. posted, um, okay. and they all seem to be all uh, uh, being around. Uh, I think I will hold on to uh, Jonathan's question yet because I want to continue with the. Uh, let's um, Jerry. Let's put the other one by. Ko Kai Hong, because let's just continue the the AI uh, the the AI thought of three. Uh, he has he or she I'm not sure has asked. Do you think that new technologies such as AI can change how people research? Now I think probably um, um, it's more towards your uh, the 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 agenda today on research. So. Yes, I, I think that the, these new technologies can change the way in which we research because they are going to be really exact and very precise on um, information that um, without this technology we would never dream of having. No, in this sense, I think that uh, putting and I am always uh, repeating the same message. No, if we are able to put this uh, technology at the service of research, at the service of students' real needs, at the service of governments and educational policy makers, um, they are going to change a lot because um, prior to them, we, we couldn't we couldn't analyze this huge amount of data uh, in order to no to interpret it. This is the role of the researchers. So we have the IT professionals. That are the ones no, that are able to um, move all this information, no. But we are. It, it is our. It is our function here, the one of researchers, on uh, to see how we interpret all this data and how we uh, translate it in terms that policymakers, uh, school leaders, uh, higher institution, uh, higher education institutions uh, leaders can read and can uh, make changes afterwards no mm. Nice. I, I think I think we are reaching a certain level of maturity with the uh, softwares that are available for us to do research uh, and I, th I think I think more and more development is taking place in that area so I would think also that the a uh, AI powered uh, research softwares. Currently, we have uh, some softwares that, that, that help us, right? Uh, but I think the AI-powered ones will be the ones that will be really, I mean, not even just our data. They might even be mining data from the, from the, yeah. from the internet and, and maybe even providing us with comparative analysis of our work with other people's work and I think that is going to be huge, um, but we need we need the we need the the, the 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 as you say the computer technologies the researchers to to have that different kind of a discussion about yeah, you know what you need in the software. I think this 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 
area for me is that it's a huge gap yet still even yeah. even uh, even as an educator i am constantly thinking i need a support i need a support system i don't mind having a robot in my classroom but i need that support you know i mean as as educators we are doing so much of administrative work in the first place i mean why <laughs> Why should we be doing yeah, yeah. so much of administrative work when we have all these technologies? Yeah, we cannot have more human beings because, you know, the, it, it is a big, huge cost. But if we have more software, I mean, that can be scalable. I mean, we can scale the software. So this is an area, I think, huge, huge area of development for education and research and teaching and learning that. I feel it's still untapped, yeah? Um, let's see, we have Kenji who has another question. Um, Kenji said, may I know how long do you think the concept of teaching with artificial intelligence will be generalized in future? Will it be something common next time? It's, it's very difficult to, to predict. Maybe we, if we met again, no, uh, in three, four years now, from I, I think that the, the scenario maybe uh, would be clearer than, than, than it is now. Uh, it has happened with a lot of technologies. 15 or 20 years ago, we didn't even have, 15 years ago, we didn't have mobiles or smartphones, no? And now they have challenged everything and they are everywhere, no? And they are going to stay forever. We don't know what's going to, to happen with uh, artificial intelligence, but of course it's a technology that's going to, to, to be present everywhere. And, and it's, it, it should be our lives easier, no? And also our professional, as uh, Dr. Abdar was saying before, our professional approaches uh, better and the processes always um, should be, as I was saying before, put at the service of, of the students' real needs, no? I, 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 yeah, I agree with you, Mar. And I think I also want to share with KNG my experience um, I, it's like yeah, it's already been twenty years since my PhD. I wrote my and 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 and, I, and I've completed my PhD. And in in my PhD conclusions, I'm I mentioned very clearly that we need um uh we need uh, artificial intelligence. We need agent technology, and and for the past 20 years nothing happened you know in that area and then in the last two or three years boom you saw that that super increase in the use of ai and how ai is already penetrating uh, into the educational era i i feel i feel that it will be um, i think i think uh, it has finally caught up uh, you know, and I myself am very excited because uh, my recommendations have, haven't been picked up even by myself because at that point, the AI technology was not prevalent. But now I feel like I wish I had 10 AI researchers with me <laughs> and I could do something impactful in teaching and learning because we already know what is the issue, what is the problem, yeah. but we don't have that kind of a support. No, so no. so I, I would be willing to again talk a bit more on this. Um, and, and I think our UNESCO chair will be probably will be will be an area that we can talk about. Um, I think pretty soon Asia Pacific University will set up the UNESCO chair on uh, using innovative technologies to support teaching and learning and we are quite excited about that and i i also uh, would like to invite our participants if they are in the teaching and learning uh, field you know to to talk to us more about since a lot of them are asking about the ai <laughs> mm, yeah. let us see uh, we have mike 20 let's just take a poll we'll come back to you but let's see uh let's leave uh, mike Okay. Hi, Mike. <laughs> uh, Mike Gwenty was actually my PhD student uh, uh, and uh, I'm glad to have you on board, Mike. Um, let's see what you are talking since we have not met online for, for some time again. 
I and my colleagues are looking at how AI can be incorporated in our LMS to assist, oh my God, in ID, perfect their content design and premium findings are over. Mike, that is interesting. So, so you you are already looking at AI and how it's incorporated. Uh, we need to talk more, Mike, uh, once uh, the UNESCO chair is set up at the Asia Pacific University. I think uh, we would be... Do you have any comments on that, Mar? Oh, no. um, not really. Uh, I, I was acquainted with some experiences of uh, private schools in Catalonia, but although they are not, they they were not many, we we uh, which had uh, done something similar. But uh, I'm not. Um, if you want, I could I could uh, look for it. But I I'm not sure if they really carried out research on that. It was just. Uh, um, the use of, of this uh, technology into Moodle. I think they were using, uh, using Moodle to, to track the progress and to predict the academic uh, achievements of, of their students. This, there were, I think there were um, a, half, a half of uh, charter schools that were dealing with this. They were interested in working with that. But, um, I don't know, how, I, don't, I don't have, uh, much detail on that. This area that uh, Mike Nguyenti is getting into, right? The uh, it, it is hugely needed. Like we 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 spend so much time um, trying to uh, trying to assist academicians on how to um, improve the the, the 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 instructional design of the. Uh, or their learning design in the in the learning management system it's a huge mm -hmm. gap and yeah. uh, and um, and uh, i i feel this this will be uh, something that is very interesting you know so that so that see the our our academicians i'm not only talking about asia pacific university uh but but we are doing a lot of training, uh, you know, we are supporting UNESCO, we are supporting the Commonwealth of Learning, and now we are finding out that there is a huge need. So if we can then incorporate artificial intelligence into the learning management system, then I personally feel this is going to be a huge um, uh, uh, experiment to close a little bit more of the gap, and I'm, yes. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to know of this project, uh, Mike. Yeah. yeah. Um, there is um, there is one one. There are one or two more, and I think we are just about having about three or two more minutes to to the end of the program. Uh, Paul Sim has asked. I'll come to Jonathan towards the end. Yeah. Paul Sim has come to uh, have asked, uh, do you think the problems of creating a generation of competent individuals in regards to digitization lies on the lack of hardware or software? In my view, there seem to be a needed balance. Mm. Good question. Of course. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Good one. Yeah. 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 Good one. Good. Good one. I think. One. I think yes, uh, Paul. I think uh, we need. We need because we we um. We have seen, we have heard during the pandemic. We have heard how how um, so many teachers, students, educators faced problems of um, hardware and software. And then at the other end, uh, those who had hardware and software, uh, the delivery of the the, the whole process, uh, the, the the pedagogical side was also another issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the balance will be good in that. Yep. Yes, and when the, when there's this lack of knowledge of this technical knowledge on the one hand, then the 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 the, the, one, the, the, the pedagogical one is the one that suffers, no? So that our students and mm -hmm. even our teachers, for example, if they don't get and it, this relates maybe to another question that you were keeping towards the end, which uh, was I think I I could read yeah. it here. Let's look which at we that now. Have, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How can we nice, encourage? Nice. Yeah. It ties yeah, nicely how, to our discussion. Uh, this this of question. Course. Can we have that question uh, by Jonathan? What are some ways to encourage teachers to get excited about ed tech? That's of the course, final question, and that's your yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the that's the key question. No, that's the key question. Yeah. 
maybe one one of the opportunities that we could uh, draw uh, from this pandemic, no, which has been so devastating, uh, is that um, a lot of teachers have had uh, the, the, their first contact with with technology, no, and for the first time, even they always had access to teacher training process uh, programs and, and a lot of uh, uh, proposals by the administration, not the educational administrations, uh, to learn. <clears throat> uh, it has had uh, to, to, to arrive a, a pandemic, a pandemia, no? to, um, to make them aware of the importance of this. Uh, how can we encourage teachers um, we can encourage them uh, by showing by showing uh, good practices relating to to the use of technology, but also by making um, important and ambitious, very ambitious teacher training plans that can uh, serve their real needs. No, and this uh, leads me to 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 the, to the consideration of uh, teacher training programs have to be preconceptualized have to be different they have to be more uh, they have to be shorter they have to be uh, really um, they have to go stick to the point they they teachers when uh, it, it's uh, an example of, of this could be when uh, we go to Netflix or to these uh, huge platforms not platforms no uh, to watch a series or to watch a film uh, teachers should uh, have access to to repositories in which their teacher training needs were clearly identified that they could take them that they could personalize their itineraries uh, and, and they could find all the answers that they need um, I think that uh, we have to be aware of um, all the all the uh, situations that these pandemic times have, uh, have made uh, a floor, no? That we have to uh, be really cautious, no? On these uh, challenges that digital transformation can convey, and teacher training here would be a, a, a key asset uh, if we want to to have our systems ready. If we are, on the one hand, we're um, talking about artificial intelligence and these uh, really advanced technologies, but we have a task for of teachers who are not ready, who are not, who don't see the, this need, who it, it's very difficult that as a whole system we can, we can advance, no? That's, that's really very interesting, Mar. And, and I think the, in your presentation, you also mentioned about um, having leaders leaders who are competent in the in the digital yeah. in the use of digital technologies um and that, that is something i think um may may also be um, a, a key criteria uh to so that i i feel um if the leaders are not having the kind of enough competencies or skills or knowledge about the use of technologies then then they may not encourage the teachers to be uh, active in the schools in this area. And I've seen it. Uh, I've seen uh, leaders in schools, school principals, who are really, you know, in touch with technology, and they they push the agenda in a way that that can also excite teachers uh, to adopt. And I and from my also from my personal uh, experiences. I keep on thinking that a hands-on kind of a, of, a, of a curriculum for teacher training mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, will be very useful. And I keep thinking that uh, theories, concepts, principles, like, like what you did today, you know, you kept your presentation to the minimal uh, to trigger a discussion, you know. So I think this is what should happen, you know. Teachers should not maximize um, or teacher trainers should not just keep on uh, talking in the classroom, they should talk very little and then open up to demonstration, hands on, so that teachers feel more comfortable. They they feel like they have touched it, you know, they have played with it and not just listen 
and and be unsure what they are you know what actually was being taught because the more you work with it the better your 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 experiential learning is very 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 important um well i think we had a very good discussion ma uh thank you actually i think the trick was to keep it short and then to open it to more talk and uh, to more um discussions uh it's too bad uh, that uh, we we can't hear the voices of our participants yeah. but uh but if we could then they could also you know give their voice to our discussion but fine we are still happy that uh, we have been able to conclude our let's talk id series uh with a great discussion and and food for thought mar uh, thank you your experiences as the director general has helped us to um, understand better um uh, what is happening on your side of the world as well so that um we we could we could then tap i think tap into the pro proper resources and and also our participants um have also come on board uh, you know so we also can tap into into them uh, it's always nice to share what you are doing you know um and uh, I leave the last words to you if you have anything else to say. Okay, no no, just to thank you um to thank you all um your patience no for keeping um uh, keeping attention during this um this conversation. I think conversations are very important. I think uh, international networks are, are basic are basic if we want to advance uh, in this uh, digital transformation, and I think that the, uh, that we we need to 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 work in collaboration. We need to see what our colleagues are doing. We need to learn one from another, and I think that uh, this uh, this is uh, what this uh, conversation was was about: no? exchanging practices, uh, sharing experiences. And maybe this is uh, the beginning of, of future collaborations that I'm sure that I'm sure that they're going to to be. No? Thank you so much for inviting me again, and you yeah. all have a very good day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mar, and uh, you have a good day yourself. Uh, your day is just starting, and yes. uh, we will meet again. Thank you to all our participants, and uh, we welcome you to connect back to us in case um you have uh you know you you would like to write to us or you would like to connect back um uh, we have the dl hub at staff email dot my email where you can write to us and uh, maybe we can i'm just hoping that we can collaborate mike do keep in touch with me let's talk about your work and let's see how we can incorporate that back to the the bigger agenda Okay, thank you, Mar, and thank you, Jerry, who's backstage, uh, helping us with the with the streamyard, uh, and um, we wish you all uh, all the best and uh, a better year next year. <laughs> this year is uh, coming to an end, and we are glad that uh, we have ended it with a nice discussion with Dr. Mar. Thank you, Dr. Mar, again. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.